it should just yeah great perfect this is all online so derek thank you very much for doing this and definitely your experience your memorable experience needs to go out and prospective applicants and generally people get inspired by that so thank you very much and if you want to just introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about how this jams thing came up with you if you want to do that yeah sure i, I i'm professor eric okay uh, and i'm a, a, an academic and dispute resolver based in aberdeen in scotland and I was a JAMS fellow uh, in uh, 2016, and how that came about was I had uh, I was teaching co-teaching on a program in Aberdeen University with uh, an academic in Baltimore, Professor Deborah Eisenberg, and she suggested that JAMS might be a, 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 a an, an opportunity to conduct some research into uh, intermediation and to get over to the US and and meet some people there. Uh, and so as a result, I applied through the, 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 the fellowship program and, and was successful uh, and was privileged enough to be able to travel to the US and take part in the program. Um, uh, I, I, just to explain, I had been an academic now for 20 years, roughly. Um, and before then, I was a, a litigation practitioner in Scotland. Uh, and uh, more recently, I think, Undoubtedly, partly as a result of the JAMS program, I've, I've started to diversify a bit more into dispute resolution uh, practice, uh, and so doing mediation, arbitration, and education um, uh, away from the university. So I'm diversifying a bit, changing a bit, I suppose. Um, I, I, and some of my experience has been in. Uh, so I've got I've got some mediation experience again, as I say, it's inspired by some of the recent experience inspired by jams, uh, but I've also got some experience on the adjudicative side. So as a tribunal judge, part time tribunal judge here, and and it's useful just to see the contrast between adjudication and consensual resolution. So I think that's helped a bit in terms of my perspective so that, that that that's how sorry i don't know if that's all answers too but too long but that's how i i got involved in jams and it was a great opportunity and um really helped me open my eyes i think is the phrase um to what's uh, just how important and deep-seated mediation practice can be in, in a country and, and my experience was in doing research in the us the practical part of it and being an academician how does that relate to each other and how did you take that the theory and the practical good question because um i i mean they're, they're very closely related and, and actually they, 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 there's, there's a very important link between the two um because one of the challenges i think in a country like scotland and in the uk generally uh, is that when lawyers are trained and obviously law schools um, tend to mainly be training um, lawyers, uh, you know, uh, training of lawyer, you know, providing law degrees, but, but also master's degrees. But in, in, in the undergraduate law degree, because in, in the UK, the law is an undergraduate discipline, um, there isn't really a focus on mediation um, or if there is, it's, it's in elective courses. And so there's very much still a culture of litigation being the main method of resolution. Now, that's a problem because I think that in order for um, the practical to come through, for people to become interested in mediation and to, to start looking at mediation as, a, as an option, that has to start in education. Uh, because when I was trained as a lawyer, um, I was very much trained in a, in a sorry in a litigation culture, and litigation was really the only game in town when I was a practicing lawyer. There was this thing called mediation, which was mainly about family cases, and you know, even then it was a bit um, kind of uh, non-mainstream. And so, if mediation is to be made mainstream in a country, any country, I think it has you know the, the educational part of of qualification process for lawyers has to include a you know quite a, a heavy emphasis on on mediation as one of the methods. I don't think that's the case in the UK. It certainly wasn't the case for me. 
Um, but uh, so that's how the two connect. I think I think partly there's other ways in which they connect, but that's that that's something that came to me when I saw just how embedded through the Jams program, how embedded mediation is in the US, and how broadly it's used. Um, it struck me that for there to be a culture change, as I think there, there will be, uh, it's a slow culture change, but it's coming in the U, in the UK. That that has to be. Uh, that culture change has to be uh, to be assisted by a change in education culture. Well, I don't know what I, what I I was discussing with Judge Halim. He was also J- Jams fellow just before. I mean, we had a session. I had ex- recording his experience. What I was telling him was, look, we have introduced it from this year in our the law degree that mediation ADR is going to be one part of it. But the point is that finally, if I have to show these children something in the future in mediation, the problem that's taking place is, is developing through the court system. In the court system, mm. the mediators get next to nothing. I was just telling him that in a, say in a, it's in a particular high court, there is a mediation center. So now this senior counsel is running that mediation center. The senior counsel gets $10,000 a hearing. The mediator gets $100 for the entire mediation. Mm. How do you how do you explain to that child? Okay, we can tell him, we can give him the theory, we can do whatever. But what about the next stage? We have to show a certain path that I don't think is going to happen very soon if we don't take the right steps. And for me, the court system is an issue. That's a big issue. I mean, I'm, according to me, that is one way where, where the profession is kind of getting destroyed in most countries. Because I, I I'll tell you, I did a symposium with about hundred speakers from forty plus countries. And I was, of course, I was sitting in each of those sessions because I was doing the symposium and country after country, the same story, the same story. And I keep giving this example of Constantia from Brazil. And you'll hear me every time I give her example. She says, in my lifetime, I want to practice as a full time mediator. I want to see that happening. Can you imagine? She's also a professor. She's a professor in Brazil and she's just doesn't, it's not happening. So we have to relook the way it is developing. That's, that's the way I've, I mean, that's the way I look at it. I don't know about your yeah, experience on this. I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I think there are two things that you've highlighted there. One is funding for um, and, and and fees for mediators. And there has to be a change there because um, if it's to be taken seriously as an option to be used and not just at the fringes, but, but mainstream, a mainstream option, then mediators have to be able to, to make a living out of it um, if you know, and, and to be treat and to be to be remunerated on a on a on a level which is similar to that of those who are engaging in litigation. Otherwise, um, lawyers will and, and professionals will not want to or not be able to afford to, frankly, become mediators. Uh, uh, so that's one point. The second point, which actually is, is very interesting, is your 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 um, observation about the courts. And to me, that's the that's part of the problem. Is that um, uh, mediation should not be seen as, in my view, ideally as something which, well, we're in court, it's expensive, it's taking a while, let's just try out this mediation option. It should actually be at the forefront and should be being discussed early on before uh, the parties come to court, if indeed they're to go there. And so that comes back to the education point. Lawyers should be talking to their clients about it early on and saying, okay, here are the options, we could go to court or we could try something else, this thing called mediation and explaining it rather than doing it once the court action is going. And as apart from anything else, uh, obviously if you're in court and you're going through the court system before you come to the option of mediation and whether that might be because the judge has suggested it or because the other side is suggesting it, you're already spending money um, and, and taking up time and you're you're becoming polarised, which is what sometimes happens in the court system. So um, I think to, taking it out of the court system, and maybe that would resolve something, some of the, 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 the sort of remuneration issues, if you like, um, is, is taking it out of the court system and making it a mainstream option on which advice should be given routinely uh, by lawyers. And interestingly, in um, I'm sure this is the case in other jurisdictions, the, the, the Law Society in Scotland, there is a practice guideline in, in, in place which requires lawyers to give uh, clients advice on uh, alternative dispute resolution. I don't like that phrase, but that's what it's called. Um, uh, methods uh, in order that they can make an informed choice. Now, I'm just, I just wonder just to what extent that practice guideline 
uh, is followed. Um, and if it was followed properly, so proper advice was given on the options, I think many more clients would choose mediation early on so that it's not done in the shadow of the court. But I totally agree with you, remuneration and connection with court are two problems which need to be resolved before you can have a serious mediation culture. Yeah, because the way I looked at it and all these discussions, the fundamental issue comes from the fact that the courts have a massive backlog. Massive backlog. I mean, country like India, four, we have 43 million cases lying in courts, pending cases. So mm -hmm. and the number mm -hmm. that come in and the number that go out are the same. So we have that large chunk. For the, so for the judiciary, it is self-interest. They just want something to get out of the system, whatever can get out of the system. But yeah. their self-interest, for me, has no, no relevance for me because their self-interest cannot spoil a finish of a profession. So that is where the mismatch is. And the foundation there is wrong, it is, is weak because judiciary, like I said, has a self-interest but has nothing to do with mediation. Litigation and mediation are totally different routes that a person has to take. The moment you merge both of them in some way, first of all, you're sending a message out to people in general that somehow mediation is connected with courts. And I keep telling people that, look, this whole, the whole mindset of being a colony has always given us this thing that courts are the place to go for dispute resolution. First of all, we have to get that out of people's mind. But yeah. how do we get it out of their mind when you are doing it in the courts and that's how it's developed? I'm, I, I'm also saying, Derek, I, in the US thing, I dig it, dug a little deeper there also because of part of the symposium, I was looking at all the aspects mm. of it. Dug a little deeper there. Found out 100 million cases are filed in courts every year. And we talk about a jurisdiction where 40, 45 years of mediation. So the court system has not worked somehow. There is some fundamental issue there that if you thought that mediation will take off, then low, slowly private practice will develop and allow to be out of the court system. Instead, what is happening is that these mediators who come into the court system, because it's all controlled by lawyers, mediation is controlled mm. by lawyers. That yeah. is it. So they take it. So, so what they do is you have these mediators who come into court thinking that they will be recognized by lawyers and they'll get some private work. They don't get anything. Because what, why would a lawyer want to go and ask his client to spend something outside? They want their fees. So they use that yes. court system mediator and the mediator gets disheartened after some time, moves out, the next lot comes in. So there's Jeff Kichawin in the US, he's full-time mediator, which is rare, okay? Like me, full-time mediators are rare in this world. <laughs> so he, he's, he was telling us his own experience. He said, I used to give this time and these law firms, these lawyers used to come and use me. And I used to say, okay, why don't you look at some private work for me? He says, why should we do that? You've given your time for free. We'll use this time. <laughs> so he, yeah, he's yeah. I mean, certainly, certainly uh, the pro bono um, mediation uh, problem is that is the one you've just identified, I think, is that when you get it for free, why would you pay for it? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. But what's interesting about judges is I found here anyway in Scotland, I've, I've seen a bit more interest in on the part of judges and mediation. But, you know, because I think, as you say, there's a there's a docket which is uh, congested uh, and they see it as a way to try and um, resolve that problem. Uh, I, 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 and in, in a sense, persuading judges because of that is maybe easy, easier in a, in a way than persuading lawyers. Um, because lawyers, as you say, then feel two things. One is, are they going to lose income? Yep. Because it, uh, you know, because it, it, the, 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 the dispute might be resolved more quickly uh, and with less work on their part. And secondly, are they going to lose control? Because I think it's, some of it is about control. Lawyers like to control um, the case. And of course, if you give it to a third party, and with the lawyer maybe involved to, to, to some extent, then you're losing control. I think lawyers are used to losing control to judges because that's just what you've got to do. You've got to hand it over to the judge to decide. But losing control to a mediator, that, that's something that they're not used to. And, and therefore, I think there's a kind of natural uh, fear there. Uh, one of the other issues is involvement of lawyers in mediation. Um, and I was just speaking to a colleague about this. It, it strikes me that... that um, uh, my, my, my perspective is that, that lawyers can be heavily involved in mediation in terms of representation, in terms of preparation, then representation, and then the post-mediation agreement that hopefully is reached. Uh, and again, I'm not sure to what extent that's understood. And also there are opportunities for lawyers to become mediators 
uh, and, and again, if they're involved in mediation representation, then that will help them along the way to potentially becoming mediators themselves down the line. So it's all these things that we need to, we need to I think keeping the, the lawyers on board is crucial. And I know that they did that very effectively in Baltimore and, and Maryland, where I spent the time with my JAMS money, if you like, uh, with the funding from JAMS, I spent time in Baltimore and, and, and the University of Maryland and, and met lots of professionals and observed mediations and other things. And it struck me there was strong judicial support there. I think Judge Bell was the name of the judge uh, a number of decades ago. And that strong judicial support and bringing on board the lawyers in the development of the mediation system was the key to its success. So the lawyers were persuaded there is something in this for us. This is a good thing. We should be getting involved. And that meant that the system was successful. Um, if the lawyers are not brought on board and they don't buy into it, then my view is it just won't work, not in the kind of wholesale way that it should work. Um, but that's that's a big job, persuading lawyers to change oh, the that. way in which they operate or to change anything, actually. And I say that because I've been, I, I, I've been one myself, so I know I'm not, uh, uh, you know, commenting on lawyers as if they're a different species. I, I was one. Uh, and I know that the fear is that, you know, you know what's in front of you, know the business you're getting and you want to preserve it. Um, and it's fear of change, I think, that's, that's at the heart of it. The thing is, look, I'm also a lawyer. If I comment on lawyers, mm. of course, I will still <laughs> not, not comment on individuals. But yeah. as a general category, so I'm saying that that aspect of lawyers taking control of mediation also hasn't worked. Yes, they've taken it up, but they've used it to their advantage that, okay, so many cases come into courts and we have so enough work, so it's not a drop in revenue. We are still, we, we, I mean, 100 million cases is not a small number for a population of 300 yes. million. So look, if you I look at the jam mm -hmm. situation, jams has a total of eighteen thousand cases in the entire year, and suppose the world's largest they say ADR institution. So numbers mm -hmm. don't match. I mean, hundred million there and eighteen thousand here. So private practice has not developed the way it should have, and lawyers have taken over in that sense of that control. So I don't think that is also the root. Finally, I could say that look, let's look at the culture of mediation definitely down at the grassroots definitely. But the problem that I keep telling people is that look in the US, if it's been there for 40, 45 years, the user experience definitely should have been really good. So definitely people should have spoken about it. But Derek, can I just let Kathy in? Kathy is actually getting, she gets confused on the time. Her show is tomorrow. <laughs> she did this on Friday also. There's a show called Evolution of a Mediator that I do. So she's part of that. And she, she's got it wrong twice. She's in Canada. She's just coming in. Yeah, Kathy. Good morning. Morning. You got the time wrong again. <laughs> Did I? I, I thought you said it was Monday. <laughs> no. Oh, it's, a, it's actually, okay. Derek is here. Derek is in Scotland. We are recording a show called, it's called Mediator Experiences. So basically it started with the series is basically about mediators telling us about their memorable experiences in relation to mediation, not in a mediation specifically, but in a in relation. So, so he's a Weinstein Jams International Fellow, was a fellow, he's a fellow. Okay, whatever. So he, we're just talking about that. So that's how it is. And yours was on Tuesday, my Tuesday. Your Monday. Well, your, it is Monday here. Yeah, but, but what time Monday? Your Monday. a.m. So we'll record it after Derek's Derek's thing. We'll record, record yours. What's the problem with that? Well, so if you want to. Here, so I'll wait. Yeah, nice it's to like, meet you, Derek. If you want to take a break, you want to have your breakfast and all, you can come back. You too. Oh, Good to meet you. I'm all ready. Okay, anyway, perfect. I'll perfect. call back at, at 6 30. Is can, that. You can stay. You can stay. You can also uh, talk oh, to Derek. Derek, he's a yeah, he's a nice guy. You can talk to him. That's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, we were just, yeah. so, just recovering from from COP. I'm assuming if you're in Glasgow. Yes. Or... Well, well, I wasn't at COP myself, but uh, yeah, it was the certainly was 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 uh, in the headlines for for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kathy's in. She's in a place called Falkland in British Columbia in Canada. So she had gone through a tough time with these bushfires there. So she had to evacuate also. They had to evacuate. Oh so it was quite a serious thing for them. Oh no. Kathy, you want to tell him about that? Well, now we're not, well, climate change is having a significant impact on this part of the world. Uh, we've had significant wildfires, probably off and on for the last 10 years. 
yeah. in a one in 200 year cycle in quotation marks. <laughs> mm. um, and, uh, and, and so now we have them pretty much every year. Last year was the most significant fire season that we've had. And of course, in combination with clear cut logging, there's nothing to hold the soil in place. So when we get an atmospheric river going over, dumps a month's worth of rain in a less than 24 hour period, uh, huge mudslides, every major uh, road, include highways and any little minor road are all closed. So there's no access from where I am uh, to, to Vancouver, which is the third largest city in Canada. There's no access. So we're mm, running out oh of gas and food um, uh, all over the place. So, and, and people have unfortunately died in these huge mm. mudslides. The major Trans-Canada Highway has been washed out. Yeah, so that's, that's real, um, uh, you mentioned COP, I mean, that's real global warming. Yes. Kind of um, ha having a, a real effect, that's, that's, uh, that's terrible. Interestingly, Cathy was also covering the COP26. So she's now mm. connected on that end also. She's looking at what's happening there and she's affected by it. So there's a mm. very close connection to what's happening. I and mean, she's really experiencing it. Of course, I, I mean, whether it's only that, other reasons, we don't know. I mean, I would not know, but there's a much larger issues involved. But definitely there must be a connection. I, I would have to mm. take that. I'm interested to hear about, about your work, Derek, and I'll just... Uh... Try to listen quietly in the court corner. Vikram knows I'm not great at that, but um, I will attempt. <laughs> okay. But she's she's not interested. I mean, she, in the symposium, her session interesting on art and mediation. Also interesting. Mm. You, you should watch that in the, the the recording is all there on my YouTube mm. channel, so you should watch that. But we were talking about Kathy. We were talking about his experience, these jams thing, and we from there we were talking about generally what's happening with mediation and my thoughts on why it isn't developing and Derek's thoughts on that. And we were just kind of on the, we were on the same page on that. And in the next few time, maybe climate change, we might not be able to do something about, but maybe we might change the way mediation is looked at. In the day. <laughs> we're discussing I'm, that. I'm very interested to hear because it's something that I have written about and talked about for many, many years. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective. Yeah, yeah. Your please perspective. come in, please come in when you want to. So totally, it's an open discussion. It's not a problem. So, so, so basically, but, but I mean, the larger picture, Derek, is that if the whole thing has to go on and we have to develop it, I think we have to relook the way it is been practiced. And I was, that's what I was telling you that the whole jams thing and only 18,000 cases in the whole year or ADR cases, that too. I don't know how many of that in mediation. I haven't got that statistics from there. But just that aspect tells me that private mediation has a long way to go. There's a long way to go there. Even in countries where... 40, 45 years. I mean, if that user experience was so good, why would you first go to a lawyer, file a case in the court, and then look at the mediation option? I mean, they think, so either the user experience is not good, so maybe we're not required. Maybe not just we're not just doing our job. Maybe it's we are not we are not we are there only because definitely there's a backlog. Because one in this in the symposium, there's someone who's he's from Israel but living in Germany, so he's he compared the two. He said, Israel, the mediation is quite popular because the case, the backlog is huge. And Germany is not so popular because the courts are very efficient. So are we just saying that the fact that mediation is not that good, but the fact that people are, don't have a choice, so they're doing it. So I, don't, I, that's, I think that should not be the reason for taking mediation up. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the US example is an, a bit of an anomaly, as you say, if it's been so embedded for so long, why is it not more, why is it not used more? I, I just wonder whether the, I, I think a lawyer coming back to lawyers being the key here. I think there are still, and I suspect, and this is just a suspicion, there's a lot of lawyers in the US who still um, want to litigate and prefer to litigate for various reasons, maybe vested interests and, and fear of change and, and habit and education being these all, all being factors, I think. Um, so my suspicion is that it isn't the user experience that's driving that. It's that, that the culture is maybe in pockets within the US. There are certain areas where mediation is more popular than others. There are certain lawyers who embrace it more than others. Um, so I think it all comes back to, it's, it's to do with change in culture, I think. Uh, and, uh, and there has to be a, a kind of a complete... Um, change in how legal advice is given that that to me is the key because um 
when we think about it, litigation is the cho- is, is is the is the main the main method of, of resolution of, of most disputes. You know, statistically, I mean, um, there's no reason why it shouldn't have been mediation. I mean, I think mediation is older than litigation, much older. Uh, it's just habit. That's I think that's all it is. Uh, and that habit begins in, we talked a little bit earlier about education, that begins in university because we teach a lot of litigation in university. Uh, we teach a lot of case law, and that's litigation, obviously. Yep. Uh, and 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 we and, and mediation is a kind of add-on, and we sort of say, oh, this is a, even name alternative method. Is, is it, what's alternative about it? It's not really, it's almost like if you can't do it this way, then try the alternative. Even the word alternative is wrong. And, and so... I think there needs to, it needs to be the, the whole system of re- resolution needs to be taught differently. That there are equal options out there. Litigation is only one of them. There's also mediation. There's also arbitration. There's other methods as well. Uh, and there's a genuine choice that you have between these different methods. So that comes in educational stage, I think, in terms of how lawyers are educated, and then of course how lawyers practice. That's what needs to change. And if that changes, if lawyers begin to dis- do things differently and give advice in a different way, that's when you'll get the culture change, I think. Because the user experience point, I suspect the user experience is very good. I think parties like it. Um, and of course, when it works, they really like it. And even if it doesn't work, you can get a failed mediation where there is some progress made, failed in the sense that, that you don't resolve it completely, but where you might actually lay the ground for a later resolution by negotiation as a result of the mediation. So um, I, I suspect user experiences are good. It's just that the culture of litigation, or even if you want to call it adjudication, because you might include arbitration, the adjudicative culture in lawyers is still very strong. That I think that's the only way that, that the mediation landscape can change. I change significantly. I mean, well, then, look, I, what I saw from, okay, this was also coming out from the symposium also, was the fact that there is a deal-making concept that the lawyers bring into mediation in the US. So it's not about the user experience as to the mediation as such. It is the lawyer got me a deal kind of mediation. So if in that kind of a situation, you feel you need the lawyer because the lawyer is getting me a deal. So maybe that is why the thought of going to a lawyer, for, to, to a mediator first and cutting out the, you, you might say, look, the lawyers, it's good to sell the concept to them, but that will take that route, which is going to be through the court and coming out of it. While I'm saying if that user experience as the mediation process, if that is the good user experience, then you would think that the mediator can balance things out. So in that sense, if you need legal advice, get in an expert. A lawyer is an expert. Similarly, in a project, you could get an architect as an expert. Why do we consider lawyers to be part of the process? Why do they have to be part of the process? That's a good question. I, I, I think I think I think that's a much deeper culture, which is would be extremely hard to shift. Um, and I think for me, uh, I, I, I don't I don't see getting lawyers involved as, as uh, early on in all cases or in most cases as, as an issue. I think that, it, back to your original point, Vikram, which is is that they're getting into the courts first and then mediation. What I, I think needs to happen is that lawyers are talking about mediation from the outset. And so they're getting clients to agree to mediate uh, instead of the court, not, not as a kind of, you know, an adjunct of the court process, but to, to, in other words, to mediate rather than litigate. Um, because I think that cutting the lawyers out, um, if, if that's, a, I, don't, I don't mean that as a loaded phrase, I just mean um, allowing or, uh, or encouraging clients not to go to lawyers, but to go to mediation first. I think that's a big ask. And I think it's, it's going to take a long, long time to change the culture of, I've got a dispute, I need to get my lawyer. Uh, that's just you know, people will just think in that way. Um, it's just what they, what happens once they get to their lawyer. That's the point. Uh, does their lawyer suddenly think, okay, let's get into court, um, or does the lawyer think, hang on, should we try something else here? And if it doesn't work, then we can go to court. It's the latter. If if the lawyer start thinking in the latter way, I think that that's 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 not so difficult. If you like, that's not so. That might not be such a culture change to change the lawyers rather than to change the clients. How I'm developing it here is that 
of course being a lawyer that advantage that i get is that of course you can look at him for the legal part or if there is something to be discussed you can discuss that so that advantage i get but the way i'm developing is and this is something that even the parties they do not want to involve the lawyers that's the best part so because if you have been stuck in a say in a litigation for 14 years and you know what it's mm. gone through so you know what that mindset on the other side is but they still want them to be involved in say the settlement agreement okay let's get them you mm. in it and they have seen resistance from them they've seen resistance from the lawyers when after everything has been or everything settled is just the language they've tried to put as a, a spanner in the works it is a big issue because if you yes. have you've got this golden goose why would you let it go it's just it's it's way if yeah. years years yeah. so, so that advantage i'm getting mm. yes i can get that advantage which you can also get as a lawyer that you can act people would the parties trust you they trust you on the legal aspect also that they don't not need someone from outside they don't need the lawyers into it so i've seen that it works so that's i don't see that is an mm. issue and it's something which i feel for at least for india that is going to be the way it's going to happen because there is so much pendency there and people know they've experienced the whole concept of going through a lawyer they've experienced that so it's not something that a lawyer is taking you through mediation okay if it, if i don't i i'll go through the lawyer and okay finally they get it settled no this is going to be the route with a 4 15 20 year route you are going to take that so i think my model here is a little mm. different i don't know how no it is no it sounds different it sounds different i mean i think i think I, yes i mean ideally i mean i suppose why would you pay for two people when you can pay for one so why a lawyer and a mediator when you can just pay for a mediator exactly. so i uh, i communicate directly with the mediator um right. so if it's possible then i mean i'm thinking of the culture in the uk um i, I think it'd be very difficult to change but but if it's possible in other jurisdictions to say well look we don't need the lawyers because uh it's just a direct route to mediator to the mediator then then that's that's ideal i mean you know you know that 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 would be that would be obviously sensible to to try and um go down that go down that route uh the the only, i mean i suppose that, that at the other end of that when you reach agreement and you want to record that agreement um then i suppose even if you haven't had a lawyer you might be tempted to go to one and i think you're you're suggesting that lawyers might throw a spanner in the works then when it comes to the agreement and i've certainly seen them one or two mediations fall apart on the agreement exactly. so they reach the agreement exactly. in principle yeah. Yeah. and then and i'm talking about as a mediator now so i can imagine for for lawyers doing that that would be even more of an opportunity uh, not an opportunity but a possibility at least uh, where you're getting down the wording of the agreement and the difficulty the, the devils in the detail in getting the wording agreed so the in principle you've agreed a deal let's say the parties have agreed a deal um but in in actually recording that deal the, there then is a problem and uh that's a that's a shame isn't it because you've done 90% of the work and then the 10% um, 99 99 maybe 99 yes and the 1% of the recording of it is where it it falls down and also another thing about about getting lawyers in at the end which sometimes happens is that there's a delay and now we're thinking a mediation you've got momentum and you want to try and get it concluded on the day when the parties are thinking yeah that this is fine I'm, I'm, I I agree to this when the parties go away to get legal advice it takes a few days lawyers speak to them etc start to talk about it. and before you know it there's a chance that the deal could unravel um before it's actually done on on paper and again that's because of the involvement of another party if you like who's not been in the mediation so doesn't understand how the whole thing has been stitched together very cleverly perhaps um and and so you could end up with a problem so i i agree with you i think in principle i just think that the depending on the culture depending on the country sorry the culture of changing what the client's behavior might be more difficult than changing the lawyer's behavior and on the other end in india also definitely the mediation advocacy that aspect is being spoken about and getting lawyers as mediation advocate definitely that whole process but i'm saying from my personal experience at this point of time we are at that point when okay again a lawyer mediator maybe because i'm talking from that perspective mm-hmm. is someone who can actually is someone who parties trust they trust they actually trust yes. they, they do that and the per the outside counsel that you have parties also understand that where the spanner in the works is being put they do understand that luckily the thing is that because being a lawyer there was one particular agreement five words were added 
that five words had would finish off that whole thing. just five words because i was there i could explain to them and i could explain where this is going and why this is not required and everything but otherwise they were they they done their job it was finished so i i'm just saying that there is there is going to be a different model maybe because if this is that initial stage when people obviously they like this whole thing alarming drop of revenue and all, all that people keep talking about with they're at that stage they don't know where it's going so first is don't let a good law stay we have the best law in the world i keep saying on mediation but the lawyers on the other end go out saying there is no law on mediation can you see can there be such a it's such a different view on the same thing can that be that there is some issue there because we have something called conciliation which was in we got in 1996 when the ancestral was using the word conciliation we took their model law but they took that advantage mm-hmm. saying there is no law on mediation once it all had to clarify in its own in its own new model law that it is the same thing we were using the word conciliation now we are using the word mediation there is no difference in the definition also they put it there but something or the other keep confusing people to the point when they say oh this is, seems to be too complicated is it enforceable not enforceable this that and the other get them into court so there is i mean you have to fight that out on the other end i have to fight that law thing out which is what i mean i did my the, the, the mediation bill has been the draft bill has been put out now so i had a little discussion okay. on that of course i'm little too maybe a little too militant about it the way the whole concept is being destroyed and there are lots of things in that okay that's a different discussion altogether but there is lot of resistance there but let's look at the nicer side your experience your nice experience of your the with due to jams and what you discussed and what you learned something on that yeah so so jams the the, the two parts of it um the, the first part was there were two parts of it the first part was the was the week in san francisco with the other fellows where there was an intensive training and and socialization and discussion um um part to the fellowship and that was um very enjoyable very well looked after um some great classes and discussions where we learned about mediation not just in the US but obviously in the jurisdictions of the other fellows from all around the world and um so a sharing of ideas and thoughts uh, and really quite inspirational i found um uh, partly because of this uh realization of my part i mean i hadn't done much mediation then i'd done some mediation teaching but not much mediation and um Scotland is still still is I'm afraid but 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 certainly was more so a kind of uh, very much a developing nation in terms of arbitration culture in 2016 and so my eyes were opened uh, to just how much mediation there is out there globally in particular in the US where it seems to me uh, and this is something I found out partly on that one week with other fellows in Strand San Francisco but partly in the research I did with the jams funding uh, I couldn't believe how, how you know the breadth of su- uh, subject matters which could be mediated I mean basically everything I mean more or less everything so I I was thinking you know uh, you know it's used in family cases uh, uh, workplace mediation and neighborhood disputes and that's kind of it really but uh, you know everything could be mediated and I met a number of professionals Uh, in the US who are mediating things I never dreamt and I, I never made a connection in my head that subject for example freedom of information disputes mm-hmm. I mean I, I would never have the word mediation would never I would never have thought that would could in any way be connected with disputes over freedom of information requests um or data protection requests and that's a, you know quite a big area um even appeal um proceedings are back to in court again um with with litigations and appeals being mediated and 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 just all kinds of child protection and uh, criminal cases and commercial of course uh, and just just anything and that fascinates me because i think uh there is a sort of issue with in this country anyway with with mediation generally as a sort of alternative and you've talked about court and how it's and lawyers vested interest there's also a a kind of blind spot when it comes to um the kinds of disputes that can be mediated and there's an assumption that it's only these disputes in which there is an ongoing relationship between the parties or maybe an ongoing relationship and that that's what you're trying to preserve but in fact that's not the case and that's one of the things that I noticed in particular 
in, in, in my studies and or my my reception in in the US. And uh, so I, and that's influenced me really because I've uh, I, it's influenced my teaching because I've introduced examples of things that I saw in the US, uh, both in the week with fellows and in the, the rest of the research project in the US. Uh, and in Baltimore in particular, which is where I went. Uh, and and it's also influenced me to want to do more of it. And I have been doing more of it. And as I say, I've set up a, 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 an agency which, which offers dispute resolution services, including mediation. And that's partly because of what I saw in the US with the JAMS funding. So it was inspirational, I would say, for me, uh, an eye-opening, um, because I was very much a novice uh, on on mediation compared to to to, to some uh, who are there, and I think the Jams program emphasises that in its criteria that it's not necessarily you know it's for people who might want to uh, do work uh, in, in emerging cultures and mediation, and that's very much uh, was was and still is very much the case in in this country. So um, it, it was great. I mean, it, it just uh, had a huge effect on just how I viewed mediation generally. Okay. So basically, it helped you when you came back, and but but how much is it actually developing in Scotland? Is it not part of the culture now? It is developing a bit. Uh, there's been uh, some moves in the Scottish Parliament. There's been some some legislation which has been introduced to try and encourage mediation. It's not it's it's not clear given COVID whether you know that that's not a priority just at the moment. But there is interest in government in mediation. Uh, 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 more recently, uh, there's more of it happening, um, uh, 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 and there's more. Some of it, as I said to you earlier, is, is from the from the courts, referred by the courts, uh, and some of it is um, uh, lawyers, uh, and some of it is just people being more aware of mediation and looking at. We've got an, a, a register of mediators accredited, which has been going for a number of years now, um, uh, uh, and so people are with obviously with the internet. Because just looking at mediation and, and finding mediators themselves. Mm-hmm. And certainly I've been approached a number of times just recently, uh, having set up this agency by people who clearly have not come through lawyers, they've just um, heard of it and, 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 and come through the list uh, held by the, the accreditation body. So there is more of it happening, there's more awareness of it, people are understanding that it can be an option. Um, so uh, but but in terms of culture change, that that that's that's obviously a different kind of thing, and I think that's going to take. Uh, I keep coming back to education, but that, I th- I see that as the as the main way of doing it. I think the education system has to change, so that the kids coming through university are talking about it and understanding it. So when they become lawyers, it's just something that they know all about, as opposed to for me, it was something that I'd heard of, but I didn't really know about it. Um, you're, you're not going to do something that you just know, don't know about. You're not going to recommend something that you just you don't really un- properly understand. We have. I might interest you to know as well that we have a course at the University of Aberdeen where I teach. Um, called it's a quite. It's been around for a number of years called Alternative Methods of Dispute Resolution, and big component part of that is on mediation. And there's some group, there's some role play and that kind of thing as in tutorials as well as of course theory. What was interesting about that course, an elective course was that it attracted about 50% lawyers and about 50%, I mean, law students, and 50% was were from all across the university, engineers, biologists, historians, uh, language, students, politics, you name it. Practically every um, discipline across the university was represented on this course, which was open to law, you know, law students and non-law students. And I found that fascinating that that uh, there was interest from other disciplines, and it got me thinking: Is that another way of expanding? Because uh, another another possible solution to the mediation conundrum of you know promoting mediation, making sure it's used more often, uh, is to promote it to the clients, um, not just the lawyers, uh, and so that you've got a situation where you know your future engineers, surveyors, you know, you name them. Uh, where obviously they have a dispute. Um, if they've heard of mediation, they go on and mention it to the lawyers. And as you'll know, Vikram um, and Kathy, as you'll know, uh, you know, what, if a client mentions it to a lawyer, then they've got to give them advice on it, obviously. Um, it's easy for the lawyer not to mention it, maybe. 
Um, but if the client raises it, then you're in a different territory because the lawyer then has to say, well, okay, I've got, I better explain this to you now. Uh, so um, maybe more awareness of mediation, not just with law students, but with students in other disciplines, because they are the future uh, um, professionals and other workers who will be, um, who will have the disputes. The disputes belong to them, not to the lawyers. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you my experience with all this. First of all, the first thing is I did a deal, I go straight to, of course, people I know who are, of course, general counsels and all, and work comes from there. So, of course, I don't have to go through lawyers. That's one good thing. The other thing is actually pushing it to, like you said, to other people, like there's interesting, there's this Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. So there's this person in Mauritius who organized a webinar. He called me to talk about the, developing the culture of mediation. So largely, there were these uh, surveyors on that. So one of them got motivated. There was a project. There was a dispute. He actually did it there. Successful. Sold out on the concept also. No, not a, not a lawyer. Not as we call a mediator. But I keep saying you are a mediator. I mean, people, you are a mediator by your mindset. And th these are so many people out there who can do that. We just have to tell them. All I did was in that webinar, I just spoke about the fact that we what, were what generally about mediation. I don't even really get too much into it because it's such a simple thing. There's nothing much to tell you about. It's one paragraph mm -hmm. thing. That's all it is. But the fact that you can actually just talk to someone and they can go and actually resolve a dispute. Same thing I did with, with an architect here. I told him about, I, look, first thing you have to identify those with the mediator mindset. So that is, according to me, the most important thing, which is what I'm trying to do. Get people who have the mediator mindset into the profession or the ones who are out there who are in a way into the profession. Let's develop that, get them in. So this architect went and did it in his project. He said, look, I was kind of forced to do it, <laughs> but he did that successfully. So it's just the fact that there is some hyper technical thing being connected to mediation. So this symposium that I did was called mediation in our culture and traditions. The whole theme was that people might not know the name. They don't know the word mediation, but they're familiar with the process. It's not an alien process to you. No. We just have to connect them to that. So that is what, how I'm trying to develop it from that end. Because what is happening on the other end, what the world that we look at in mediation world is creating a too technical an aspect to it, some rocket science it is. I don't know what is going to happen. On the other end, there are in villages in India, it could be in Scotland also. They are those people who are trusted by people. And mm -hmm. there are only few people who are trusted. It's not that everyone has it in them. I can't make you a mediator, which I'll tell you. I mean, this whole that evolution of a mediator, that series I started only for that. You don't make a mediator in a 40-hour factory. It's mm. Kathy is a mediator because she's gone so much. That's why this, this episode that we'll be recording for this is part three of hers. This is just that take us through your life and we will relate to all those aspects and we get to know why you are what you are. She's not a lawyer, but she's also she's doing interesting work there. So there's according to me, mediation is like the blind man and the elephant situation. There is so much out there, but this one aspect of it gets highlighted too much because the numbers are not there. This whole concept of all these institutions and all, there are no numbers there. I mean, I look at Singapore in this, how many years, 700 cases. I mean, come off it. What is what are the numbers there? But these institutions are spoken about. But it's not, I think we have to look at mediation happening at the grassroots level all the time. In a country like ours, when we say 18 million matters might sound too much to you. It's nothing. When I look at the US situation, 100 million, uh, 300 million population. Brazil, you look at the number of cases there. So we are still not that bad only because I think there is something happening at the back. There was some report that we had here that said in the courts, only 5% of the matters go into courts. So those 95%, there's some system we have in place. So we have a large rural population. Okay, 60% is rural. So urbanization has also created that problem because the fact the people who are oh, traditionally out there that whole concept goes there's no connect with the community there's no ownership in the community so disputes go to a different level so i think that aspect also it's a lot of things which have to work together so it's now so i think but if kathy has something to come in on kathy anything oh it's such an interesting conversation um you know i think i think the two key words that stick out for me are are, are trust and, and education. Um, and then the other aspect of it is that, you know, if we look historically at the legal justice system, system of course, 
it's been developing over over centuries and and uh, but the focus of the legal justice system has been primarily to protect the interests of land old landowners and and property uh, uh, historically and and mediation has been as as Vikram says uh, this mediator mindset of people who are called upon by the community to help settle disputes between parties. And, and that's the big difference, I think, is that the legal profession in Canada and the United States has, has really co-opted the word mediation because they could see the loss of clients <laughs> going out the door into this other process, alternative being an interesting word in and of itself, going out the door to another process where they no longer have the control to make the decision. Mm. And, and I think that's that's a, you know from an ego perspective. Ooh, mm. you know I have the I have the control here. I can fix this for you. It's it's that looking outside, <clears throat> excuse me, of ourselves instead of saying I have the power and the control to resolve this difficult situation with another, and I bring in a trusted party to help me do that. And I think we've lost that that understanding of what's really going on here. And and for me, that's at the core. And and uh, you know, as Vikram said, I'm I'm not a lawyer. I'm trained as a mediator. I I was first exposed to to mediation as a process in the 1970s when I worked at an international institute in in Vienna. Um, so I've I've seen as you were talking about there, Derek, the involvement of so many non non lawyers. And I think that's one of the things that in BC has been happening for quite a long time is that. There's an institute called the Justice Institute, and and much of their training is provided to people in other professions who need these skills uh, on a daily basis to resolve. You know, management spends what 40, 50 percent of their time handling disputes in in their business in in whatever way. They need the skills that mediators have, and that lawyers sometimes lose sight of. And and my grandfather was a lawyer. My daughter's a lawyer. <laughs> I understand the lawyer as a, you know, the practice of law uh, from a different perspective than perhaps many non-legal mediators um, do. So uh, those are my thoughts, but it's an interesting and ongoing conversation. And I watch, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what it's like in, in, in Scotland, Derek, but uh, here in Canada, I see a huge push by legal mediators towards arbitration. And again, I see this as a as a desire to main control, maintain control over the outcome of the dispute. Uh, mm. And th that for me feels like what we need, who we need to educate are the parties. And to say, you can choose to go down this path where somebody will make the decision for you, uh, arbitration or legal justice system, or you can go down this other path, which may be harder, but it's likely that once you and the disputants come to an agreement, it's going to be longstanding. You aren't going to have to go back to the courts or go back uh, somewhere else. Mm. So Derek was also speaking about this control aspect of it. He was also talking about the same thing. So everywhere in the world, the conversation is the same, <laughs> but the and That's the end right. result is also the same. Not much work is happening for look for me. I, I tell you, Derek, we I had uh, Andrew Miller, who's uh, one of those leading mediators mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. He says there are eighteen thousand certified accredited mediators in the UK. Five hundred I worth. I mean, that's a serious thing coming from him. I mean, I, yeah, want to I think that. I can believe that. Yeah. So no, I think I think I mean uh, yeah, and I think I think the conversations are similar. I think I think certainly the control point and the ego. You mentioned ego. Well, that's a big problem. Uh, I, I, and the idea that I wonder if lawyers, some lawyers think bringing in a mediator is kind of a, a sign of failure on their part to negotiate a dispute. You know, because they're going to bring in this other person to help them, and also just to. You know, are they going to, I, I, I mean, maybe it comes back to control and, and to what extent there's a relationship between control and fees, um, and, and and obviously loss of loss of income, uh, and just fear of something you don't understand. I, I mean, I think I think that that's right, and I think your point, Kathy, about educating clients is really well made, and I think that um, if they're given the choice and given information. Uh, then, then they can make that choice rather than the lawyer making it for them. 
uh, and also if they were if they knew more about it, they could they could ask. And there are lots of clients I suspect go to lawyers. Well, I knew that I don't suspect because this is how, how it worked for me when I was in practice. They would come to you and say, "What do I do? Here's here's the situation. Tell me what to do." Uh, and the lawyer would then say, "Well, here's what I think you should do." And of course, technically, as we know, the client provides instructions to the lawyer, but actually, in reality, it's the other way around. The lawyer instructs the client, uh, and and that's the problem because the law, the client doesn't have the information to be able to say, um, what do you think I should do? Uh, tell me about mediation or tell me about, you know, is there any alternative to going to the courts or an arbitration? Is there any other way we can do this? So that, uh, and if they have the, 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 the knowledge to be able to ask the right questions, then the lawyer would then have no choice but to give them uh, advice. Um, the other thing is, of course, Mandatory mediation, that's something that's been discussed in England more recently um, at high level. So that's something that's probably going to come down the line. And also kind of, uh, I know in England and Wales, they, do, they have the, this thing, which this, this um, concept, which they don't have in Scotland, which is to hit parties for costs where there's an unreasonable refusal of a, an offer to mediate. So, okay, you, if you win, you get your costs, as, which is the usual rule. I know that's not the, the, rule, the rule in the US, for example, but it is in the UK. Um, but if you unreasonably refuse an offer of mediation, you don't get your costs, even if you do win. But that's uh, which means, yeah. which means, if you get an offer of mediation from the other side, um, you've got to think very carefully about whether you uh, you know refuse it. Because if you refuse it, and then it's deemed to have been an unreasonable refusal, and you won't know that till the judge decides at the end of the case. By then, it's too late you don't get your costs. Now, if you don't get your costs, that could in some cases be catastrophic because the costs can sometimes outweigh uh, the sum in dispute or at least be a large proportion of it. Uh, and so I'm really interested in that. I, I don't know whether, I don't know if the statistics from England, that's been around for a while, uh, as to how many more mediations there are, and, and this is in all civil cases, apart from, I think, family cases, um, how many more mediations there are as a result of that cost pressure uh, because lawyers must be advising their clients, you better accept this offer to mediate, because later on down the line you might be hit, you know, uh, in the pocket if it's de- if if you refuse and that's deemed to be unreasonable. Uh, and, and there are some people who don't like that kind of uh, pressure to mediate. But what's wrong with it? I don't think there's a thing wrong with it, because uh, you're already forced to litigate. Why shouldn't you be forced to mediate? So it's, it's being forced to do a different thing. Look, I, the, why I find an issue with this is only because of the fact that who is sending you to mediate? It is the judiciary. The judiciary is inefficient. Mm-hmm. It's the most inefficient institution in the world. In India, I keep saying that the court should put a board outside. We deny justice because justice delayed is justice denied. They should just put the board there. And please don't mm-hmm. come to us. Please try some other method of resolving your dispute. I like that. Let, that. let them do that. But now they've tried to take it up on themselves as if they are, I mean, they are the ones who are going to control that aspect of you. You know, talk about yourself. Talk about what you are doing. No problem. Pe- developing the culture, damn good. Very nice. People should sit. But who's doing it? And are you doing something about yourselves? I have that question to you. I'll give you an example. In the symposium, again, I've been giving this example and repeat it here. If, so, say, if the villagers go to the government, say, we want a road to be made to a connecting a village. Government is overloaded. It says, no, you have to make the road yourself. And the villagers, obviously, I mean, we came to you, you, you make the road. No, you make it yourself. And this aspect of cost, if you don't make it yourself, you will be penalized. This is what mandatory mediation and costs is that. I compare it to that. No one questions the courts because, like I said, this whole colonization kind of mindset that it is the courts who can say what they want, they can do what they want. The mindset has gone to the people also. That is why this whole thing of going to lawyers and talking about a, that dispute resolution happens in courts and lawyers are the ones who help you resolve disputes. These two things have to go out of the mind. That whole conditioning that's happened over centuries has to mm-hmm. go away. Dispute resolution doesn't have to go to lawyers. Dispute resolution doesn't happen only in courts. These two th- aspects, we have to push on that. Dispute resolution has always, I mean, it's not that the person who was trusted, you had to check what the qualification was. The person was trusted. The person did not have to have legal knowledge or whatever, because for me, I keep telling people, you don't need legal knowledge because law has to be fair and reasonable. So even if a person doesn't know the law and tells you something that is fair and reasonable, that should be the law. And if that is not the law, then you should challenge that law. 
So I'm saying that. Yeah, I think I agree with that, Vikram. That's an interesting point because when you when you look at complicate the complicated legal tests that that exists that exist, and of course the legal tests are different depending on the type of dispute. It all really boils down to one thing, and 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 in my tribunal cases, and as a as a part time tribunal judge, I see this all the time. You can you can look at complicated legal tests, but at the end of the day, the, the answer is what's fair. Exactly. And and all legal tests are based in fairness. And you can boil down more or less the law in every area down in a dispute. I mean, because it's different when it's non-contentious. But the law, when you're talking about a dispute, uh, boils down to the 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 the, 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 right, the right answer legally is what's fair and reasonable. Absolutely. Uh, and and it doesn't matter what, what whether it's commercial law or family law or, or criminal law or whatever it is that that's what the law does and it dresses it up of course in different language for different types of dispute but that's at its heart what it is you just look at it and say what well, what where does the fairness lie and your man in the street who's not a lawyer understands that perfectly I think absolutely exactly wisdom so, so is the main thing that's one yeah, of the it. challenges of the education system is that we aren't training lawyers to think that way. And I, I'm saying that mm. based on my personal experience. I used to teach a course on mediation for a local university. And I had these young law students and they had cases that they would come in. And my, my job was to help them learn about the practice of mediation. And they'd come in with these mock clients and everything. And the lawyers, the mock lawyers would start talking to each other. And I'd say, wait a minute. It's the parties that have to talk. And they're like, what do you mean? No, I'm here as the lawyer. I'm going to I'm gonna talk. It's like, no, no, no. The dispute isn't between you and the other lawyer. The dispute mm -hmm. is between parties. They need to talk. And, and it was, you know, it, it was going in the face of their training to act on, on, on behalf of their client. And I think that's at the core of, of the difficulty of, of lawyers acting in the role of mediation is because they don't understand that core element that Vikram is talking about, that you're talking about, which is that that fairness. And we put all this law on top of fairness mm -hmm. and, and, and actual process, the actual dispute between two parties gets lost in that. And I think that's one of the big challenges from an education perspective. Yeah, I agree totally. Absolutely. I agree totally. So yeah. Derek, what we're going to do now is you're going to give us your concluding remarks to inspire people to perspective. <laughs> this this year's applications are done. So for the next year, look, this is just what, what came out from this entire thing for me was that, of course, there's this one fellowship that happens. But I said, I, what I looked around and I saw these very interesting people wanting to do interesting things in mediation and not having these opportunities. So what I'm doing now is getting people who would fund these people. So it's like, I won't call it a fellowship only because of the fact that gender, the gender aspect to it, <laughs> that is not mm -hmm. a gender neutral word, maybe not that way, but otherwise create something. So that is the interesting thing that came out, that we have these individuals who, have, and they're sitting in small towns in the world, and but the thoughts of doing good in society in relation to mediation, they have those good thoughts. So let's find people who would fund them and let them do whatever project, learn from people, and then take it forward in the place where they live. So that's what the good thing. So in that sense, please inspire those people. It could be the Jams Fellowship or it could be the Mediator Vikram <laughs> Foundation, whatever takes it through. But what do you tell them about what you would want to, whatever, your wish. Okay, well, I, I think that... Uh, uh, there's a lot to learn about mediation, and and when I when I took uh, on the Jams uh, fellowship, when I was accepted into that fellowship, um, I I didn't know a great deal about mediation, but I came out of that fellowship knowing an awful lot more than I did before I went in. So there was a huge knowledge exchange there for me, but also not just knowledge. There was a kind of inspiration because I saw I met and spoke with dozens and dozens of people, some of them the fellows that, that, that were on the programme with me, uh, but lots of other professionals uh, who were enthusiastic about, about mediation and who told their story about how, how, you know, how they had become involved in mediation, how they enjoyed it and how it worked. So it was, it was the knowledge and the inspiration that I took from uh, JAMS and it struck me that, um, strikes me that if you are interested in mediation, if you do want to do some work, uh, to try and understand it more and to take back that understanding to your own culture, your own country, 
then a fellowship like Jams is just the ideal vehicle for doing that. And that, that's what worked for me. And it's had an impact on my professional life because it's directly impacted on uh, how, where I've taken my own uh, professional work. Um, it's inspired me to do more mediation, to get more involved. Uh, and that's exactly what I've done. So it's not just uh, uh, that, that it, it was enjoyable and and uh, allowed me to know more about mediation. It actually changed the direction of my career uh, because uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed the experience uh, so much, and it and it really opened my eyes. I've, I've I've said that before, but that's that's really the sort of uh, the key thing for me that happened as a result of that of my uh, my fellowship with Jams. Perfect. Only thing I won't end it here because before ending all my shows now, I take people through what I do in a month. So for November, I'm just going to take you through that. You'll have to sit through maybe two minutes of that. I hope okay. you don't mind. Because, no, of course not. Because people really don't know what I keep doing. They <laughs> do a little too much, maybe. <laughs> so I want to put it out because LinkedIn, Facebook don't show you all the posts. So this was the symposium. Rafael from Mexico called it the Woodstock of Mediation and I loved it. Mm. And he he made this poster on the original poster of Woodstock. So, okay, so 90 plus, okay, the speakers are 90 plus. It's He made it before the, the end of the symposium. So that, mm. so interesting, this was nice. Then mm. this this whole this new series I started, Mediate Experiences, talking about memorable experiences. Now it's basically the Jams Fellows for some time. Then we'll take mm. up other other people. So Adi, I don't know if you don't know Adi. Uh, Adi, then there is Tatlim. All these are done. Yes, I've seen, all, I've seen, yes, yes. All these are recorded. Of course, you've seen them. Yeah. Miglia is the Migla, one. Who, I, yeah. Yes, I do know Miglia. Yeah. yeah, because this, this, this uh, other show that I do in Conversation with Beautiful Mind, she had come on that. And that is when she had spoken about the fellowship. And then I saw the post. Then I said, okay, let's take this forward. Then we have Kachajina Dan, Ivana. She's now the, the executive director of IMI. Then Gide is in Ethiopia. And Gabriela. This was a very interesting conversation. It went into a lot of areas. <laughs> this, I mean, if you have time, please see this. And then I just, before this, I just said Idaj Halim from Bangladesh. This is you. And then we have someone coming the day after. And then we had this discussion on the mediation bill in India and a workshop I did on that because I feel that that's one direction. We can give a good direction, but what we are doing is going just in a retrograde step on that. This is a lecture series I started with. Ken Klo came on my show, Evolution of a Mediator, and then he said this. I went for a lecture about mediation in two minutes. I knew that my life had fundamentally changed. Like you were saying that your life changed. So I said, there are lots of these people out there whose lives can change and they can take this direction, but they will never be exposed to lectures on mediation. He was a judge. So in that process, he went to a training, or went to a lecture series, I would say. But then definitely everyone won't have their opportunity. Let's do a lecture series with the best in the world. So... The, of course, four have done. Ken Clock's done two of them. And then we've had Tat Lim doing one. And Mr. Panchu from India has done one. So this lecture series is on that. So one point of time, Derek, you'll also have to give a lecture there. And then this it's was that to... in conversation with the beautiful mind that I do. Mm. Basically, the idea behind this series is that these are special people. Media is a special people. Let's just talk to them. This is, it's just a conversation. It's not mm. what, like what we just had. We just had a conversation. It's not an agenda. It's not a predetermined mm -hmm. kind of thing. But evolution of a mediator is for the concept that mediators are not made in factories, like I told you. They're, it's a life experiences kind of thing. Oh, this was another lecture. He's from Nigeria. Johnny, Bernie Mayer, I don't know. If, Kathy, I'm sure you know Bernie Mayer. So he's a senior mediator. I know who he is. I don't know him personally. Though, okay, yeah. so the first episode, this is the first one. Of course, this has been very like going into his what grandparents parents we're still there kathy we're still there with him <laughs> we moved on with you <laughs> he's from malaysia wonderful person this is a new series it's become a new series otherwise we were talking about michael's book but then he's into reflective practice so then let's start a series called mediator reflects so we had this on saturday it was very interesting he got some people from ireland a, a part of his practice group so they went, what they would do normally in a practice group, a reflective practice group meeting, they did that. So there were two people who were speaking about their experience and, of course, Michael taking them through that. So that's interesting, Derek, this whole reflective practice mm. thing. Maybe you would also be want to be part of that. But I'll call you for the next one in any case. Mm. 
Because there's that book discount. This Kathy, this is Kathy's show now. It was supposed to be Tuesday at 8 p.m. But <laughs> again, you've got the timing wrong. <laughs> it was my Tuesday. Today is my Monday. <laughs> okay, this is he's Rafael is the one who designed that poster and he calls himself the Santana of the symposium. So now I put okay. it there. <laughs> And then Andrea is coming. He's from, she's from Ireland. She's part of that practice mm-hmm. group. Michael also. And then we have the last day of the month, celebrating mediators, birthdays of mediators in that month. So that's how direct the month goes. <laughs> right. It looks like you're very busy, but it's all great work, I think. It looks really interesting. And and it, it's quite different, I think, from anything else I've seen in terms of uh, how it's structured um, and it's quite eye-catching uh, which is what you want obviously because as you say you want the work to get out so so that's really interesting and very well presented I mean I think I think you know the, the visuals of your your slides and, and and the kind of artwork I think is very is very nice as well very professional thank you um, thank you so so yeah I, I applaud you for your uh, for your work Thank you very much. The thing, thing is, for me, these are nice conversations. I just enjoy those conversations. Mm. These have become something that I put out and people, of course, appreci- have appreciated it. But for me, there are, these are always going to be just conversations. And I just enjoy that part of it. The fact that mm. this is going to on YouTube and it'll be there on YouTube and some people will watch it is, of course, secondary. Just the fact that I'm talking to Derek or I've talked to Kathy, that by itself is good time spent. Mm. So that's mm. that's how I look at it. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. So, Derek, we'll end this one. Yeah, you don't have to yeah. go. You don't have to go. We we'll just we can we can speak to Kathy, but I'll end this episode only for the reason because if you have longer things on YouTube, if the people would, I don't want people not to watch them. So that's the only thing. So no, thank you. Good, very much. good point. Good point. No, I'll, I'll leave you to it, Kathy. It's great to meet you, and nice uh, and you thank too, you Derek. for joining in in yeah. the conversation. I enjoyed, enjoyed that. And Victor, thank you very much. I really enjoyed our chat.